Well, good morning, Lindsay Avenue. Good morning. It's good to see everyone today. It's good to have some visitors. It's good to have some people back. We, we do have some people who are out of town, but this is a, a pretty good crowd. Hopefully, we continue to grow it. And one way we do that is by each of us looking for opportunities to invite others to come join us as we worship God here Sunday morning. A couple of uh, announcements. Uh, I do have over here on the first uh, front pew uh, several copies of the past two singing uh, Sundays that we've had, where we did sing with the understanding and sing with more understanding. I have five of them. It's got both of the two worship services in it. It's not an audio CD where you can skip tracks, but it is an audio CD where you can fast forward through it to get over some of the talking that happened in between the songs. So if you want one of those, please see me up here and I can get them. If we run out, I'm happy to get some more. Starting next month, the month of June, we're going to have a theme around each of our lessons, the four lessons in, in June. We're going to be looking at heroes out of the Bible. I have chosen two female heroes and two male heroes. We'll start that next week. First hero, or I guess I could say heroine, we're going to look at someone I don't personally recall ever hearing a sermon about, and that's going to be Miriam, Moses' sister. So we will look to see what we can learn from the life of Miriam <coughs> next week as we focus on heroes during the month of June. The topic this morning is entitled History Lesson. It's going to be taken from Psalm 106. Now, my apologies, this is a rather uh, comparatively easy sermon to do because I'm going to let Psalm 106 do most of the preaching and most of the teaching. But I think it's important that here the day before Memorial Day, where we're supposed to remember people that have sacrificed before us, that we recognize the Bible is full of history lessons, focusing on the past with the goal that we don't continue to make the same mistakes. Really and truly, that's why we have history. That's why we study history. The statement I always remember is, those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it, right? Because if you don't know what's not worked in the past, you may try it and it's not going to work again. Well, it was the same way with God trying to deliver messages to his people, hoping that they would listen. Several times in the Old Testament, there are these history lessons, chapters that simply flow through with God trying to let his people know, you've done this before, how did this work out for you? One is in Psalm 106, another is over in the book of Nehemiah. But I want us to look at Psalm 106 today to see what the children of Israel did, what the consequences were, and look at how their history played out, and then we'll try to make some uh, conclusions as we go through First of all, as we were saying, history is, is for our learning. Romans chapter 15, verse 4 uh, said, For whatever was written in former days was written for our learning, that through endurance or patience and through the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. Well, we're now 2,000 years, more or less, since Paul wrote that statement in Romans chapter 15. The entirety of our Bible now falls into this category of things that were written aforetime, were written in the past, were written for our learning. That through in encouragement and endurance, we might have hope of how we can face the future in, Zion, in the same way that that has occurred with God's people in the past. Psalm 106, as I say, is our history lesson this morning. Pick up in Psalm 106, starting in verses 6 through 7. And if you want to follow along, it's on the handouts, also straight up in uh, the Bible that you have with you, Psalm 106. Picking up, both we and our fathers have sinned. We have committed iniquity. We have done wickedness. Our fathers, when they were in Egypt, did not consider your wondrous works, speaking to God here. Our fathers, when they were in Egypt, did not consider your wondrous works. They did not remember the abundance of your steadfast, certain, unchanging love, but rebelled by the sea at the Red Sea. This is, I'm going to say, number one, or once. Keep track with me, right? How many times in this history lesson? 
the people of Israel, God's people, decided to rebel and not follow what he had asked them. This is one. And I also want you to notice the we at the front. We and our fathers. I've said it before, too often, I think, I'm afraid, when we're reading in the Bible, we're looking at that at arm's length, that 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years ago, and wonder, how could those people, those people, have been so foolish not to listen to God and not to do what God has asked of them? Well, people really don't change, even in a period of 2,000, 3,000 years. I would argue we and people in general all the time are every bit as guilty as the people of Israel in terms of God saying something and we seem to think we know better and we just don't listen to it. But I love how here in Psalm 106, this is roughly five or six hundred years after the time of the Red Sea where they're talking about this history, include themselves. It's not just something in ancient history, it's something that we have done as well. One time, they rebelled at the Red Sea. Um, when you think about that rebellion at the Red Sea, the events leading up to it, I always think of uh, Charlton Heston and Moses and the Ten Commandments, but they had been led out of Egypt with a mighty hand, the Bible says, a mighty hand. They had seen all those different plagues. I mean, frogs essentially just coming up from out of nowhere, pestilence, the water in the river turning to blood, the sky being dark for a long period. I mean, all sorts of things, including the death of the firstborn child of their Egyptian neighbors. And then leading the entire people out of bondage, out of slavery that they've been in for several hundred years. And yet they get out into a wilderness a relatively short distance away and you can almost imagine them going, <laughs> you know, I don't want to be back as a slave. Because that's how I'm afraid it may have sounded to God. I led you all out of the land of Egypt. And the first time something's a little stressful for you, you want to go back. And so they rebelled. They refused to trust in God by the Red Sea. Time number one. Look at this next, starting in verse 8. Yet he, God, he saved them at the Red Sea. He saved them for his name's sake, that he might make known his mighty power. He, God, rebuked the Red Sea, and it became dry, and he led them through the deepest, through a desert. The Bible tells us that the water, somehow or other, the miracle here, kind of welled up on either side, and that they walked through this area on dry land. I would have been scared to death. I mean, sometimes oceans can scare me anyway, right? There's always giant sharks just waiting to kill me. But water hanging up in the sky, and I'm walking through, I mean, how high would the water have been? But I think the, the Ten Commandments movie that I was referring to does a good job of that. It kind of looks like jello, but still gives you that immense impression of water hanging over your head, walking through on dry <laughs> He saved me. God saved me. Notice the emphasis that we're going to see on that throughout. He saved them for his name's sake. He saved them from the hand of the foe, the hand of the Egyptians, and redeemed them from the power of the enemy. The waters then covered their adversaries. Not one of them was left. Then they believed his words. You see the pattern? Rebellion. God saved them. Then they believed his words. This is something I would think that they would have learned from. Time number one, they rebelled at the Red Sea. God saved them. How many times does God need to show? Surely, surely, right? They learned from this circumstance. But they soon forgot his words. They did not wait for his counsel, picking up in verse 13. But they had a wanton craving in the wilderness. They were consumed with desire in the wilderness. And they put God to the test in the desert. He gave them what they asked, but sent a wasting disease among them. When men in the camp were jealous of Moses and Aaron, uh, the Holy One of the Lord, the earth opened up and swallowed up Dathan and covered the company of Abiram. Fire also broke out in their company. The flame burned up the wicked. 
You know, Dathan rebelled against the rule of Moses. I don't think that it's exactly the way it's shown in the movie, but he accused Moses and certainly by implication God of bringing them out of Egypt, not to a land flowing with milk and honey, but to a desert where they're all going to die. This is right after they had essentially accused God of the same thing at the shore of the Red Sea. What foolish people sometimes these mortals be, and I'm including us in that, to forget the wonderful power of God and the difference God has made in our lives today. We're so thankful when something bad does not happen, when something bad goes away, <clears throat> And yet we get complacent so that the next time something bad happens, we immediately want to throw our hands up and say, God has left me alone. God has left me. This is now twice. Right? The first time at the Red Sea, the second time when Dathan gets some people up in. The earth opens up and swallows the man. That's going to be a pretty good lesson to learn. You know, let's see, right? You know. He rebels against God and so whoosh disappears into the earth. Maybe I ought to remember that. Maybe I ought to remember that. But of course they won't. Picking up in verse 19. They made a calf from Horeb and worshipped a metal image. They exchanged the glory of God for the image of an ox that eats grass. They forgot God, their Savior, who had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham, and awesome deeds by the Red Sea. I've always really wondered how people could make something with their hands. I mean, I certainly would not be able to craft some kind of metal calf or any of that kind of thing. So let's just put it in my terms. I'll make something out of Legos, or I'll make something out of uh, Tinker Toys, or uh, what's, what's the metal thing, an erector set, no, whatever it may be, right? <clears throat> well, let's stick with Legos. I build this thing out of Legos and think, well, this is the God that saved me out of Egypt. He wasn't here an hour ago. You know, again, I want to look and say, how foolish were these people? That's going to be the wrong lesson. That's the lesson I draw from this. But they certainly forgot God once again. Therefore, he, God here, he said he would destroy them. Had not Moses, his chosen one, stood in the breach before him to turn away his wrath from destroying them. God came close of saying, enough of this of these people. So this is, this is only three times now. But it's three times in a short period. The rabbis believe they got to Mount Sinai, Horeb, within about 50 days after they left Egypt. Three times in 50 days, we're talking very short-term memory problems. Three times. And the only reason God didn't destroy them is Moses stood in the breach, so to speak, and said, please, this is, this is not going to look good. That people will say you brought your people out so that you could wipe them out. Don't destroy your people. Then, Continuing on with his people, verse 24. Then they, this is the people, despised the pleasant land, having no faith in his promise. They murmured in their tents and did not obey the voice of the Lord. Therefore he raised up his hand and swore to them that he would make them fall in the wilderness and would make their offspring fall among the nations, scattering them among the land. The time this is talking about is after the spies had been sent up into the land. God brought them after Sinai right over to the edge of the promised land. And they sent out some spies, people to go and check out the land so they could report back. And they reported back what? That this was a land of milk and honey. The, the, the Bible text says they were bringing back bunches of grapes. It looked like they were grapes for giants. Huge clusters of, of food and, and all this kind of stuff, right? But you haven't seen these people in their walled cities. They're like giants and we look like little grasshoppers. They had no faith <laughs> that the God who had brought them out of Egypt with a mighty hand, who had parted the Red Sea, who had swallowed up Dathan, would take care of them. By eliminating them. 
people in the land. They once again said, better to essentially have stayed in Egypt than come over here. And this is four times now. And because of this lack of faith in God, God swore that anybody that made it over there was never going to enter the land. Those that were roughly of adult age and up, none of them made it except just a couple. Caleb and Joshua, two of the spies. <clears throat> Four times now. I really wish this were like the end. So after this, they never again question the power of God. It, it, it doesn't end. Yet. Pick up in verses 28 and verse 32. Then they, the people, yoked themselves to Baal of Peor. They, they put themselves under bondage to this God of their, the peoples in the area, the gods of the Canaanites. And they ate sacrifices offered to the dead. They provoked the Lord to anger with their deeds, and a plague broke out among them. They angered him at the waters of Meribah, and it went ill with Moses on their account, for they made his spirit bitter, and he spoke rashly with their lips. Moses brought attention to himself at this point, because the waters were not what the people wanted, and Moses sins. Moses gets caught up with the rebellion of the people, exasperated, and says, must we bring out water for you out of this rock? And he smites the rock. He's, he gets caught up in it too, because when you look at this, this is five and now six times since they left Egypt that they have forgotten what God said. They did not trust in God to protect them. Even after he kept showing them what he was willing and able to do, and did. Six times in the space of such a short period. Remember how it started off, too. The people acknowledged that their forefathers did this, and yet we also have provoked you to wrath. Pick up in verse 34. When they're going into the land, they're going to go into the land. God had given them and given Joshua and the armies of man, saying, destroy everybody that you find in here, because if you don't destroy the people already living in the land, they will lead you astray. You will have intermarriage between them, and then the religions of the land, which were all centered around idols, they were all centered around the fertility of the land and the fertility of livestock, and the way they worshiped was with immoral behavior that occurred between men and women. It was going to lead the people away from God if you don't destroy all these people. Verse 34 says, Then they did not destroy the peoples as the Lord commanded them, but they mixed with the nations and learned to do as they did, as I was just talking about. They served their idols, which became a snare to them. You know, if you want to attract people to a religion, one way to do that if you're not following after God is to try to make it as pleasant and enti as enticing, as enjoyable as possible. And that's why so many of these pagan religions were centered around fertility. The Greeks and the Romans had the same thing with their temples devoted to Venus and Aphrodite. It's nothing new under the sun. Back in the time here of entering the land of Canaan, it was the same thing in roughly 1400 BC. This is seven times. Now we might think and hope seven times is usually called the perfect number when you're talking about the Bible. Surely, surely after seven times, look back through it yourself. We're only in the verse 34 through 36. Seven times the history lesson has repeated that they had forgotten about it. Look at verse 37. They sacrificed their sons and daughters to demons. They poured out innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, who were sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. Thus they became unclean by their acts and played the poor in their deeds. This is now eight times. The local peoples in Canaan would often worship a god they called Molech. And this is well down the line historically. It's not right after they were entering the 
land of Canaan. But this worship to Molech in order to encourage the land to be fruitful, the crops to be fruitful, the animals to be fruitful, and the people to be fruitful. If you don't have uh, children, then you, you, you disappear as a people. They would have a metal idol that they would heat up and they would take little newborn babies. I have no idea how they chose which newborn baby. And it would be placed on the hands and arms of this heated up idol. They would offer their sons and daughters to Molech. I mean, if there's anything perhaps that is more abominable to God than use or abuse of little children, born or unborn, I really don't know what it is when you look at how much God talks about little, little children. Amen. They did. By not driving out those peoples, remember number seven, right? By not driving out those peoples, certainly it happened, they were led astray. It was a snare to them. And they did some of the most abominable, horrible things that it seems God would allow for earth to exists long enough for it to occur. Eight times. Eight times. It's more than this. This is just eight that are recorded here. Eight times. This is a summary. Way, way more than this. Their history, I will focus on the fact that it's their choices. This didn't just happen to them. They were making active, controlled choices to do what they did. Kept repeating over and over and over and over. This really doesn't include the entire book of Judges in the Old Testament. Where over and over and over again, they left God. God let them be led into captivity or under oppression. And when they cried back out, they got brought up. This isn't talking about any of those. It's a whole lot more than eight times. We would suspect, I would suspect, God would have had enough. Well, when they're talking about this, he had. He had enough. Verse 40, then the anger of the Lord was kindled against his people, and he had poured his heritage. He was horrified, if you will, at the heritage, the people that he had called his people. The people he had led out of Egypt, the people who were the children of the promise made to Abraham so, so long before, he abhorred them as if he didn't even want to look at them. They were that horrible to God. He gave them into the hands of the nations so that those who hated them ruled over them. Their enemies oppressed them and they were brought into subjection under their power. Eventually, the ten tribes in the north are led into captivity by Assyria and disappear off the face of the earth. Poof, they're gone. Shortly after that, relatively 100, 150 years, the southern kingdom, the tribe of Judah, is led away into captivity in Babylon. God had had enough. Many times he delivered them, we then read, but they were rebellious in their purposes and were brought low. Why were they brought low? Look at this statement. They were brought low through their iniquity. When something bad happens to me, a good first place to look is whether I did something and brought it on myself. It's always easy to, to look for some other cause that's external. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it is. But many times we might use that focus on what somebody else did to avoid looking something I've not been doing. They were rebellious in their purposes and they were brought low through their iniquity. They were, God had enough, they were taken away in the captivity. Now, look at the next verse. This period covers from like 1400 BC when he leads them out of the land of Egypt. They rebel at the edge of the Red Sea. They get past the Red Sea. Dathan rebels, they're going to be brought out of the wilderness to die. The earth swallows Dathan and some of the people with him. Time after time after time, they rebel against God. God eventually has enough. I, it's as if I can't even look at you people. Take it. To the nations, it says, take it. You take it. I have enough. Look 
at the next verse of Psalm 106. Nevertheless, that has to be one of the best, most important words of the entire Bible. Nevertheless, he, God, looked upon their distress when he heard their cry. For their sake, he, God, remembered his covenant and relented according to the abundance of his steadfast love. He caused them to be pitied by those who held them captive. Nevertheless, after all of these things had occurred, God still heard their cry. <clears throat> yes. now they had to cry. They had to realize they were in this circumstance, this situation, because of their own mistakes, their own choices. They had to cry out to God as horrified as God had been through all of their rebellion, especially offering those little babies to Molech. When they are carried off to captivity and they call out to God, he hears them. Nevertheless, according to whose love being steadfast? Ours. Our love is so often far from steadfast, far from certain, far from steady. It's not our love that's steadfast. His, God's love is steadfast, it's unchanging, it's constant. We are just like they live over and over and over. I'm not I'm certainly not asking for any raising of hands. I want each of us to think back over our own individual histories. I really believe, I certainly imagine, we each can think of things that we knew better in our past and we did it anyway that would have been sinful things God did not want us to do. There is no excuse. We are without excuse, Paul says in the book of Romans. It's not as if those people in the past were the foolish ones and were better than they were. I don't believe it. I don't think it's true. I don't think it's true. Notice how the people writing this ended. After admitting all of the things they had done, after saying, nevertheless, God remembered his people, it closes with a prayer. We're going to have audience participation in a moment. I think you will see it. Save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from among the nations, that we may give praise to your holy name and glory in your praise. Give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. And let all the people say, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yes. We need to learn from the past. We need to learn from the past. I can't change my past. But I need to learn from it. <clears throat> I don't know what you did yesterday. You don't know what I may have done yesterday or this morning. God knows. The only thing I can do is learn from what I did and change now and my future. The people in this psalm who are saying this and having it written down, they couldn't change any of that stuff that was written. The only thing they can do is rededicate themselves to God as they say right here. I know that we, ourselves, and our forefathers have done all these horrible, sinful things against you, God. <clears throat> but please, please, save us. Gather us in that we may give thanks to your holy name and praise and glory in your praise. So my question for this morning is, you need to come to God or to come back to Him. I promise you, God's love is still constant. God loves you. He loves me. I don't know why. I really don't. In the same way He loved all these people who had done all these horrible things. The good news of the gospel, the good news Jesus came to share, is that God's still there. 
God so loves us and he's offering mercy and grace to anyone who understands who Jesus was and decides to change their life from wrong to right and to reenact Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection by being buried in water to perfectly illustrate the death we need to have to our old way of living and be raised to walk, as Paul says, in unison of life as a new person. You're already a member of God's family, but yet, like these people who were God's people and making choices that were wrong, you can get set right in the right direction this morning. If you need to, come and ask for prayer. We'll gladly pray with you. Blessed be the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. If you're subject to the call of God today, please, please come. Mr.